another Friday night. Yay. At least the Cubs have been a little bit more cooperative today. Uh, after the kitchen fire was put out, the Cubs were a little more cooperative. Luckily, we had enough money to eat out. <laughs> Gotten quiet. Too quiet. Quiet is only suspicious when it comes to cats and children. I'm half expecting to crash by now. Any crashes that worries me. Uh, surely they're in bed at least. Maybe. If I'm lucky. Uh, they're in bed. Uh, they're staring at their phones again. Damn it, Cubs, put those things away. You know, if you're staring at a screen this late, you can't fall asleep. Yeah, 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 I know. I do it all the time, but... I'm here to serve as a bad example, remember? I'm the one that your parents tell you not to be like. <laughs> oh, that's very reassuring, Cubs. Thank you. I know... I'm not going to get any different if I end up getting lucky or any of that. Who even talks to you cubs about that kind of shit, really? Sorry, 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 language. I know. So, when you cubs think about a story. So, when you cubs think about a story. Yeah, I'll read your story. Uh, which book? Oh, you want... Why do you want out of that book? Looks weird. Oh, you like the weirdest stories. Oh, fine. Let's see. What was the last thing we read in here? Oh, the last story we read was Snow White. Okay. Uh-huh. Let's see. Page... Flip, 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 flip. Oof, man, I didn't realize Snow White was 28 pages. Let's read something a little bit shorter. Okay, Sleeping Beauty, it's only 22. <laughs> Lovely. Maybe we'll look at it and it'll be shorter. Maybe we'll really look at it and you get to go to fall asleep and I don't have to read the entire thing. Yeah, I agree. That'll never happen. Okay. So. Uh, sleeping. Uh, sleeping Beauty. Just be glad I'm not reading the Anne Rice version of this. <laughs> no, 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 no. You cubs do not need to read the Anne Rice version of this. Or whatever name it was she wrote this Snow White novels under. You don't need to read that until you're at least, I'll say 16, because I'm not a prude. Yeah, it's one that, it's a little more mature, and, well. I've already read you the Grim Fairy Tale version of, huh, did I? No, I read you the Grim Fairy Tale version of Rapunzel. I haven't read Snow White in that one yet. <sighs> yeah, no, you know the story. At least what the story that they tell you in the whole fairy godmother and your bibbity bobbity boo bullshit. Bibbity bobbity boo bullshit. <laughs> boo bullshit. 
Uh, cubs, 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 cubs. That's not how the story in this book goes. And you wanted this version, so I'm going to read this version. If you're lucky, I'll read you the other version sometimes later. I don't know. But anyway, let me get to reading so you cubs can go to sleeping and I can go to... Now, I'm not going to check out wolvesonly.com. <sighs> now, I'm not going to go for a bit. Where do you cubs even get off knowing about this sh wonderful internet services? Okay, okay, okay. Sleeping Beauty. Hush. Okay, okay. Before I started to go to the bathroom. Sleeping Beauty. Hush. Brush your teeth. All that wonderful parental bullshit that they told you to do. Okay. Ow. God, my leg hurts. Anyway, cubs. Try this again. Sleeping Beauty. I know you want me to say Sleeping Booty, but still. Sleeping Beauty. That's the story we're reading. It doesn't even start with Sleeping Beauty. It starts with someone else. It starts with the prince, because reasons. Ow. Yeah, my leg hurts. Anyway, try this again. Sleeping Beauty. To the prince, it was clear. Demons were drinking his blood. <laughs> well, that's... Fun twist. Automatically starts with... Demons and... Ow! Damn! Paper cut. Sorry. Demons and vampirism. Did not want to get blood on this book. Lord knows we don't need it coming to life. Like the other one. Nothing. I said nothing about books coming to life when you get blood on them. Please don't try it at home. Or that's not my bookstore. Okay. There was no other explanation. No way of explaining how a boy of 16 could wake each morning with his head pounding, his skin clammy and pale, and blood dripping across the sheets. Other than not being a boy, I don't know. No way of explaining how small, red-rimmed wounds punctured his neck, biceps, and chest. Ooh, kinky. No way of explaining how he dreamed of faceless forms on top of him, feasting on him. Only to wake with his shirt torn open and no one there. Okay, so, clear that the boy has issues. That brings us in alright. At first, he went to his father, the king, but no father wants to hear the torments of his son's bedchamber, especially demons that go against God. What demons go to God? No. Insistence, the boy buried his neck, showing the cursed marks. Promptly, the king, prompting the king to send to the doctor, who probed the boy with rods and steel and confirmed the king's suspicions. He needs a wife. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, the boy's getting sucked on in the night, and the court doctor says, Get this boy married. <laughs> oh, if only that were so easy. <laughs> okay. At this, the boy went to his mother, confiding in her power that afflicted him. The bloody handprints that stained his sheets, the haunted ghosts of his mornings, but the queen knew no good would come in believing him. Because the queens, I guess. So it continued. The prince afraid to sleep each night, eyes wide and vigilant for his foe, only to smell a strange rush of roses and stir awake. Shirt ripped, sun kissed like a sleeping beauty, sucked of blood once more. Oh, well, the boy's sleeping beauty in this one. That's kind of cool. I guess, maybe. 
The wounds in his skin healed in time, replaced by fresh ones roving up and down his body. He was a prisoner to the demon, who neither showed its face nor seemed to want any more. anything more. No bargain or sacrifice or ransom, only to drink from the sleeping prince. Good luck, kid. Soon a dark shame filled the prince's heart, especially when girls began to vie for it. For he was at the marrying age now, with eligible females paraded before him each morning and afternoon as he sat sallow and ravaged. His father and mother beside him, jurors to a pageant of beauty, gifts, and talent. There was a princess of Sarapol who brought a hundred cherry blossom trees. The countess of Corkina who reached her head into a tiger's mouth. The marquess of Salatimbanka, who did a dance of veils that seduced the men into sleep. Except for the prince. That was it, that is. Is it boring or just not enticing? He stayed wide awake as the Marquesa writhed and whirled. The bells of her anklets jingled jangling. She swung her hips and did the splits. Men moaned and dropped into sleep. The prince numbed to it all. The prince has not gone through puberty. Seeing his father snoring in the dancing well, pleased with herself, the prince feigned slumber as to not be rude. The cruel irony, of course, against the demon. Sleep caged him ruthlessly, but facing a woman's term, he battled it away like a soap bubble. Why had the demon chosen him? Why no one else? Then again, he couldn't be sure he'd had moments with page boys or men in town, even the odd night, where he'd seen the same haunted power, the odd placed scarf or upturned collar that seemed to be hiding something, the same frightened eyes he saw in the mirror each morning. As if they too had cut the melody without cure. But then he put the thought away. He was the only one. He was sure of it. The demon had picked him. Yet, the more he considered it, the more he seemed the wrong choice. The kingdom was teeming with wanton dukes, corrupt priests, spiteful traitors, and even the prince's father made no secret of his taste for women and drink. The prince had been a good boy. <laughs> That's why. God-seeking and hard-working and disciplined in mind and need. That he would be the devil's toy was unfathomable. So what could be wrong with him? A defect in the blood? A kink in his soul? Kinky soul? Nice. Whatever it was, he had to be rid of it, so that he prayed harder, thought pure, Gave his quarters his false attentions as they peacocked and preened. And yet, still the smell of roses came. The horror of mourning, and more blood drunk in front of him. The wounds deeper and deeper and deeper, tempting him with the respite of death. But never giving him over. And so he set a trap. As clever princes do. <sighs> a solid ring with razor seal teeth hidden in the sheets where he slept. For two nights, the demon didn't come as if it was, knew it was tempting fate. But on the third night, at the peak of dark, the prince smelled the roses. A cry yanked him out of his sleep. Something was on top of him. Not a demon or a monster. Instead, a boy about his age. He had red waves of hair, a long, gentle nose, and skin the color of the moon. He clenched his bloody wrists in the folds of his shirt, his mouth quivering, his eyes bright with fear. A severed hand lay in the trap. Blood soaked into the blood leaked onto the prince, but for once, not his own. The prince and thief looked. Locked eyes. A broken-winged bird caught. Then flying, the thief for the window, gasping, trailing blood, the prince lunging after him. But he was gone into the night, a part of him left behind. In the spring, the ch prince chose a bride. There was no reason to delay. The night crimes had ceased, his sheets again clean, the mornings reclaimed with vigor and promise. 
Everyone spoke of how strapping the young prince looked, his skin rosier, his chest proud, and if whatever had been afflicting him had been cast out and replaced by a woman's love. Even so, his pick for a wife was surprising. The Contessa of Tagera, who, for all her beauty, had a glacial air and foreboding manner, like a statue too valuable to touch. Where the other rivals competed for the prince's hand, the Contessa simply claimed it, insisting that they should be married by the end of the spring, and the prince, offering no objection, as if he'd been yearning for a soul to captain his fate. Bottom. The king thought the prince should have a girl more lively. The queen thought he should have one more humble. But given their son was no longer speaking of a demon in the night, they ceded their blessing without fuss. And yet, as the wedding neared, the prince's glow doused, doused the sleepless Paul were returning. At night he lay awake in his bedchamber, gazing at the window he left wide open, wondering what became of the boy who'd feasted on him. When slept came, it came fitfully, filled with dreams of severed hands and bloodless hearts. Nozee's spell was in the night, raising heat and the chills of the flesh that became his real life. Other days became a somnolent some haze. His bride eager to involve him in the wedding plans, and the prince returning vacant looks as if to a stranger. Soon the contessa's own gaze sharpened, a snake's losing sight of her prey. She proposed a trip, a twelve-day tour of the neighboring realms that would show off their love, filled with grand parades and sumptuous state dinners, and white tie balls, glittering tributes to the couple that would impress upon the prince who awaited their wedding as much as he was at stake. A marvelous idea, clapped the boy's father, who thought some time in close quarters with his bride might restore his son's puff. Son's a puff. Soon the bags were packed and the couple sent on their way, no expense spared. And though the prince still wore a heavy-lidded melancholy, he satisfied the Contessa's wants at every turn. He gave no window to his own. Indeed, he asked only one thing of her. A peculiar request that took her by surprise. That at each stop, he be arranged to meet any townspeople missing a hand. It was an easy wish to indulge, especially since the prince's mood improved remarkably in greeting these unfortunate souls sowing sacks of gold upon them. That he was wasting treasure on maimed people he didn't know rank rankled the Contessa, but she made no signs of her displeasure, other than an offhand question as they rode through Ravenna. Ravenna. What interest do you have in them, these folks you asked for? The prince remained silent, his eyes fixed to the carriage window as if he'd left something behind. <laughs> Plenty of people suffer in life, she snipped. It is their fate. A lump of gold won't bring back their hands. The gold is so he shows his face, the prince replied briskly. He? his bride asked. The prince didn't answer. He? she repeated. Her groom paused a long moment before he turned to her. A thief used to come in the night to me. I took his hand with a trap. Now I wish to return it to him. A thief of the night, the contessa said, the words tart in her mouth. And now you wish to reward him? Not reward, said the prince, only to give back what's been taken. From a thief, his bride repeated. The prince returned to his window. He'd made a mistake in telling her, especially since she watched closely now as he... Counted, continued his meetings with each in the realm, the Contessa hunting for any signs he'd found the one he'd spoken of. But the prince's states stayed blank. The gold meted out and the wretched dismissed until the last, at last they returned back home. The Contessa content that the prince's request had gone unfulfilled, or so she thought. For back in Ravenna, he had found the thief, though he had almost hadn't recognized him. 
The hen-pecking pair had rushed the boy forth, an obsequious couple with greedy eyes intent on the gold their son had reaped them, while the boy receded, clutching a stump to the wrist. He scarcely looked the same, his cheeks sunken his and cadaverous, his muscles poorly fed, nothing like the wicked Cupid who had drunk from the prince by the moon. Now the prince and the boy locked eyes once more, the boy cowering into the shadows as if he, as if the lights of the sun might burn him into ash. Every step the prince took towards him, the boy's father and his ogreish wife obstructed, cooing and flattering to solicit solicits more gold, praising the prince's size and strength and virility, till the prince had enough and dumped the bag of coins into the streets. Stooge and Crone dove, scavenging every last one, as the prince bent toward the boy, slipping a note in his shirt, which told him to come to the forest of Eden on the twelfth moon. Hmm. For it was on this twelfth night that the prince and the contessa were married. The gardens of castle low were crystals and lights. Thousands of high-ranking revelers packed amid an or orangery. Orangery? That's an orange already. And mirror pools and Neptune fountain. The king and the queen seated in thrones like overlords, keeping track of who greeted them with the most obeisance, while dukes and counts fawned over the newly wedded Contessa, uncowed by the ring on her finger. No one paid attention then, when the groom slipped off to the forest, surrounded by the surrounding the palace, and found the thief from Moina waiting for him, just as he asked. Neither spoke a long while, the boy hiding his scarred arm. Go on, then. Go on, then, he said at last, puffing up. Kill me, that's what you're here for, isn't it? Finish me and go to your bride. No one will notice I'm gone. The prince reached into his coat, and the thief shuddered, knowing he must take his punishment. Instead, the prince brought forth the boy's lost hand. He held it in the moonlight, at once offering it to him and keeping it close as if it belonged to them both. The thief didn't move, even as the prince came closer, closer. Patiently, the prince took his arm, firm and tight, and fitted, him, fitted it with the missing piece. Their shadows twined like two sides of the moon. Tears sprung to the boy's eyes. They spilled to the ground, spreading a bed of roses. The scent drugged the prince, his eyes rolling back. He spoke with a start. A spray of blood in the forest, a shirt slashed away, new wounds in his flank. Now he turned to his wedding, a wildling of the nights, chest bared, blood spattered, roses ripe in his hair, and yet, now everyone was drawn to him, there drawn to him there where they weren't before, his father kissing him. All revelers drew close, sniffing and slavering at the prince, and bowing at his sides like dogs to dogs of a pack to a wolf. The Contessa noticed of course she did. She noticed too well when he built his own tower in the castle, higher than any of the others, with only a single window carved out of its stone. The entrance to the tower, sealed with gilded doors, carved every inch with roses. His princess wasn't given a key. That the prince would want to be walled off from his wife riled the Contessa, but there was no one to appeal to, given the king took great pains to avoid his own wife, and other than the evil public appearances, the king and queen stayed fortressed in separate wings. Because that's what married couples do. <laughs> oh. You want to stand when you roll their cups? <clears throat> it's a lot easier to sleep by yourself. I won't say it's because of the storing, but... Yeah. Still, there was something sinister about the handsome book, and the prime of his youth taking no notice of his spouse... Even when she swanned about the castle in Chantilly Lace and a pretty face and a tail hanging down. Chantilly Lace and a 
the Fenris of silks. But leave beauty spurned too long and just wait. Beauty turns to beast. Oh shit. The Contessa stationed her own guards outside the Prince's Tower, scouring the night for his visitors, but none came. She put two more high in a tree, commanding them to watch the Prince's window. But each time they'd fall asleep and wake at dawn, only remembering the smell of strain the strange smell of roses. So she suffered in furious silence, her face haggard, her hair ragged, her eyes once brilliant gems now hard, cold stones. Ouch. All the while, the prince emerged from his golden spire each morning, glowing like a cloudless sun, despite sleepless caresses under his eyes. Sleepless creases. <laughs> and red-hot wounds in his skin. Kinky. If only she could be if only she could be content with diamonds and champagne. That's why she married him after all. For the gowns and the boots and the fame. All these bounties of a princess still flowed plentifully to her. But pleasure is only a fleeting respite. With each morning that the prince looked happier and happier, Rage fizzled in the Contessa's heart, and craving to punish him for his happiness she hadn't given him permission to have. Those bitches, yo. <laughs> Soon the Contessa began to feel the stirrings of black magic, the calling of a witch. For what is a witch but a princess who is no longer has need for her prince? Well, there's a philosophical debate for you. <sighs> Which might explain why evil queens are always, you know, once you don't need their kings anymore. Hmm. Anyway, continuing. In the depths of night, the Contessa went to the doors of the prince's tower. His rose-carved vault, taking a knife, slit her hand, smearing her blood on the doors like a wolf marking a kill. Overnight, a dark spell took hold, spiraling twists of thorns, thick and purple, the color of strangled love. Binding the tower from top to bottom and shrouding the window and the thorns' teeth, like a trap once kept in a prince's bed. At last, she slept soundly, sure her prince's joy had been snuffed out. But the next morning, there was... There he was at the breakfast table, two fr wounds fresh from his unbuttoned shirt and a smile blissfully crescent, drifting aimlessly towards her as if I hardly remembered why she was there. Outside, no thorns had turned to roses. Outside, thorns had turned to roses. No more magic, she decided. She had to take care of her things herself. The worst kind of witch. That night, she waited until the prince kept himself in his tower. Then she sharpened a carving knife in the kitchen and climbed the rose vines to his window. Into his bedchamber she went, the prince asleep, and splayed against the white sheets. The half-smile on his face, a beauty waiting to be kissed awake. Not tonight, the Contessa thought. She cut his throat with her knife and then climbed down the roses, tiptoeing back to her room with a maleficent grin. Oh, they had to slip the name in. A maleficent grin. Because maleficent. I'm going to spell it out for you, kids. Give me a second. What is the definition of Maleficent? I don't want the name, I want the actual definition. I'm bored. I'm going to look at the name without finding... 
Okay. Oh, well. Definition of Maleficence. I will post it in chat, but I will also read it here. That is the synonym of baneful, but Maleficence. Working or productive of harm or evil. <laughs> <coughs> Not tonight, to confess a thought. She cut his throat and with her knife and climbed down the roses, tiptoeing back to her room with a maleficent grin. There's your lesson for the night cubs. The next morning, she joined the king and queen at breakfast, still smiling to herself, relishing the sugared toast and strawberry crepes. Sounds good. Letting the syrup dribble down her chin, waiting for the screams from the tower once the maids stood their rounds. Instead, at the stroke of nine, the doors to the dining room opened and the prince entered, humming softly to himself, his gaze upon his wife, a ring of roses around his neck, precisely where she'd slashed it. The Contessa jumped out of her chair, eyes aflame, the red scorch in her cheeks, her blood boiling so deep from the inside that she let forth a murderous scream and dashed her foot against some stone dashed her foot against the stone floor again and again and again until it shattered beneath her and she plunged straight through to her death. What? She sunk the floor until she fell through it. Okay. Did you get that, Cubs? She was so pissed off she went thumper and killed herself. <laughs> the king and queen went on eating their toasts, for these were the kinds of things that happened between sons and wives. Really? <laughs> oh, God. The king and queen went, eh, kids. You know, young married couples, she gets pissed off because he's wearing a you know, necklace of roses that she gets so pissed off she stomps a hole in the floor and falls through death. Okay. Yeah. Sons and wives. <laughs> uh, yeah. In the days that followed, the prince brought the Ravenna boy to her... What? 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 Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, try this again. In the days that followed, the prince brought the Ravenna boy to her place at the table. Across the boy's throat was a jagged scar, like the one made by a carving knife, the same width and size of the ring of roses around the prince's neck, as if they'd traded pain for beauty. Beauty for pain. The king and queen looked upon this boy with moon-white skin and wild red hair and asked him no questions, nor did the boy offer any answers, and indeed, as long as nothing was spoken, there was peace and tranquility, a family as it should be. <laughs> okay, don't ask, don't tell, you're with our son. <clears throat> you two are happy, we don't care. As it should be. Honestly, Cubs, that really is a pretty good moral for the story. Parents, as so long as their kids are happy, shouldn't butt the fuck in. Should, should just butt the fuck out. Anyway, kids happy. Peaceful. Everyone looking happy. Uh oh, gets worse. But then one day, the boy wasn't there. His entry to the castle barred. I need a grandson, the king told the prince. For <laughs> he said it in such the same tone as he once told the boy that he needed a wife. Look, kid, 
I need an air. Gets the fucking. Yeah. Uh. Okay, so that kind of goes back to the whole traditional thing: is we don't care as long as you're happy, but we need an air. Okay, continuing. The prince stared at the chair across from him, the boy missing. You will be king one day, the father insisted. A king must have an heir, must they? The prince's eyes stayed on the empty chair. Give me an heir and my guards will leave your window unwatched, the king promised. Now the prince faced him. If only fathers invested in love as much as they did their sons, he said. He retreated to his tower and never came out. Not for meals, not for courts, not for any of the beautiful girls sent to his tower, eager to give the prince an heir. Furious, the king sent guards to seal off the prince's window, but each night the men smelled the charge of roses before walking into bright, clean sun and blood-stained sheets that maids brought forth from the chamber. Night after night, season after season, roses and blood, roses and blood, like a marriage rite, the prince and his unseen caller, until the king gave up and sent his guards away, leaving his son to his shame. It's a lot of shame, damn it. Then one day, something strange happened. A maid was changing the sheets, stripping the usual marks, but she turned back. The blood was gone, in its place a child. A baby boy with rose red hair. The king came running to the moment he heard, thieving the child away from the, the prince before dropping him in dropping him in shock. He bites <laughs> he said as the child did to the queen. But it was to the prince that the son caused no pain, and he lived with him there in the tower. Shed away from the world, except for the thief that came through the window each night to watch over them, both until morning. Like a visit from Mother Moon. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cubs. I have to admit, I rather like that story. I didn't know that male vampires could, you know, have kids. I don't know, I like the story. It's a good story. Pretty much. Handsome princes can... Once they realize that they are in love with their... I guess... You know, personal demon. I hate to say it that way, because... I don't really see, you know, gay cubs as demons. So, if you're going to be happy, yeah, be happy. It doesn't matter who you're with. No, it doesn't matter your parents' blessings either. I know, you're going to hate me for saying this, and they're probably going to hate me for saying it too. But honestly... Cubs, just if you're in love with someone, be in love with someone. I hate really going into details on that, but as parents, I can kind of, yeah, see from their point of view. 
but you know, they're also royalty and they've got their own shit to deal with. Royal lineage, lineages and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, cubs. I think you should go ahead and go to sleep. Honestly, that was a pretty good story. Had some good morals to it. Parents aren't gonna stop you from seeing someone that you're in love with. No one should really stop you from seeing someone you're in love with. Despite how contrary to yeah. popular belief it should be. Yeah. Prince was in love with someone. Uh, the whole Cutting off the arm thing again, it relates back to some of the werewolf stories that I know. How do you find out who's the werewolf? Well, if you find the wolf and dismember them when you're trying to find out the person who is the wolf, well, find the same person with similar. <sighs> I'm gonna love you, let's say. That really comes, it's just... There's a reason I don't read those stories beforehand. I want my own general reaction to them. I want your general reaction to them, because... They're good moral stories. That's what fairy tales are for. Yeah, fairy tales. They help you learn and grow. Yeah. I would just in my cows be the well-rounded individuals that I hope they're going to grow up to be. And you cubs. You cubs really do mean everything to me. There's so many times it's... If I just have more for you cubs, I wouldn't be here. I would have no reason to be here if I couldn't help guide and mold the way that you grow up. I'm not saying anything against your parents because your parents are awesome people, but everyone needs to hear all sides of the story. Everyone needs to hear the original story. Everyone needs to hear the newer version of the story. Everyone needs to know what the actual story belongs to be. And I'm not just saying it because I'm... Uh, still a little... Uh, uh, I have the toasty side. Which I am. I'll admit to. But... How does the Cubs... Choices you make in life for your own. And as they are your choices, you control your story. Be the person that you want to be. Be the person that can change the world the way you want it to become. If you find something you truly want and desire, I expect you to go after it. I admit my own failings that I have been horrible at pursuing the things that I really care for. And you see that I've been suffering for it. 
that's not in it for me to pursue such things. When I could stay here and make a choice, or at least some kind of impact, now that you live your lives. Cubs, what I'm telling you is, it's your life. It's your choice. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you're wrong in doing what you do. You have to learn that on your own. I'm just saying that when you do need to make your choices, remember the lessons that you've been taught. Remember the stories. Remember the morals. And remember how they affect you. Life is the best teacher, and learning from those that, who have experienced it is probably one of the best ways to learn. Uh, I'm getting a little preachy here, aren't I? I hate being preachy. The Cubs, honestly, Life is what you make of it. I really want you to get this down. So, Cubs, you are worthy of what you become. It may be difficult to make those decisions. It may be tough choices that you have to make. We all succeed, we all fail, and it's all by what we do. There's no mysterious outside force that controls how we do things. Fate doesn't exist the way that people want it to. Religion doesn't exist the way that people want it to. The only way to proceed in your life is by learning and doing. I don't know if I can make it any plainer. But it looks like you cups are dozing off. So I just want you to remember this. It's your life. Choices will need to be made. Make sure that they're your choices. Sure, you can listen to other people's guidance. You can listen to your parents' guidance. You can listen to the religious advice. Or you can listen to me and take everything with a grain of salt. Because in the end, it's always going to be your decision that affects how things go. And I'm not saying it'll always be for the better. A lot of times it could be for the worse. But even when it's for the worse, you can still learn from it. Go out there and live your lives. Things will always seem unfair for one reason or another. Things are unfair for one reason or another. But it's just how life is, Cubs. But as it is, I want you to go to sleep, dream your dreams, live your lives, follow your dreams if you can. Everything that you do affects your tomorrow. But don't forget, everything that you do also affects everyone around you. So do your best, not just for you, do your best for everyone that you influence. That's why I'm here with you, Cubs. I want you to do your best. And that's for me. If you could succeed, 
I'll feel better. <laughs> really. Just me feeling better will be a considerable achievement. I want you to do the best for you. And knowing that you've succeeded will make me feel better. I like seeing people succeed. I want you to succeed. I hope and pray and dream that all of you succeed. I want you to hope and dream and pray and succeed. But, Cubs, you're in bed now. So what I really want you to do is pray, hope, dream, and go the fuck to sleep. Okay? Get some sleep. Dreaming is better when you're asleep. Just try to remember when you wake up what you were dreaming about.